Coffee Time Again, Exposing the Truth. Welcome to Coffee Time Again, Exposing the Truth. Dale at the Microphone, the show that demonstrates how history repeats itself. He digs into the past, shows what happens, and how it is happening now. Follow the path of history to where it goes, then relate it to today to reveal the connections. The culture that forgets its history has no future. A history buff and loves to talk about it, going back as far as ancient Greeks and Egyptians and beyond. So grab your coffee, your chair, and listen to the show. Hope you enjoy. Good morning, Mr. Diggs. How, uh, Dr. Diggs, I'm sorry. How are you doing today? Doing well, Dale. Good to be with you. Good to be with you. I just want to introduce Dr. Diggs to y'all. His name is Dr. Stephen Diggs. He's a psych psychotherapist out of California a good friend of mine for years, and I decided to interview him because he's got some interesting ideas that I'm intrigued by. He's not a conservative, which is put it mildly, but he's a good man, and I like to have him around, and I still talk to him on occasion, so anyway, let's have a warm, warm round of applause, which I know I can't hear in you, but anyway, for Dr. Stephen Dix. Dr. Dix, introduce yourself for briefly. Well, um... To, um, to address what some might consider the elephant in the room, GOP reference intended, um, <laughs> we are very different in our politics. You're quite conservative and I'm quite liberal, but I think that's something that is very right and beautiful about who we are as friends because the idea that... Um, that we must be at war with each other, you know, is a bad idea. And you and I both know that. And so we can have our differences, but also listen respectfully and also learn from each other. So I, I feel really proud of the relationship we forged because I never once has um, has our different points of view caused our our warm feelings for each other to uh, to come into trouble, you know, and um, and that's that's the way this country is going to go forward, and right. um, you, you know, and you know, there's uh, Churchill's famous statement: if you're young and you're a liberal, you have no heart, and if you're old and you're not a conservative, you have no brain. So you see, I'm just still really young. <laughs> <laughs> Except you have a heart and a brain. But I agree with you. We can, you know, we can disagree without being disagreeable about it. That's why we, that's how we've exactly. operated for years. My biggest question I have for you to start off with is what made a mountain boy like you become a psychotherapist? Well, um, I know that you're a man of faith and so am I. So the short version is God kicked my ass into doing it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like he did to me. Kind of like he did to me. When I was exactly. Young. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, um, uh, I, uh, I, I went into it when I was having severe problems. I have a very uh, difficult childhood. And, um, and so I was having a lot of problems in living. Um, I was a very damaged person when I was younger. And I went into therapy several times. And um, and it didn't work for me. And so I became very uh, jaded towards it all. And yet it was the only place I really had any talent. Every time I'd show up and start participating in this kind of psychotherapy world, I I would be very successful. But I didn't think it worked. I didn't like it. And and one time during a, a very long prayer moment when I was just so lost vocationally I was just praying and I was asking what tell me what you want me to do God and and God said be a psychologist and I said no I know you used to think that but what do you want me to do now be a psychologist <laughs> and I and I prayed for two hours Dale for two hours I prayed and nothing changed it was be a psychologist be a psychologist be a psychologist so Finally, after a couple hours, I just stood up and said, it was the middle of the night, it was out of my deck. I just stood up and said, okay, I'll do it, but I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to do it that way that doesn't work because I know it doesn't work because I've been there. And in that moment, I had a very deep 
and very meaningful connection to the other side. And I just felt, you know, God and the angels and everyone up there saying, that's what we want you to do. Do it your way. And so I said, well, okay, then yeah. let's go. Let's do this. And and since then, I've I've just followed my instincts. I prayed a lot. I pray while I'm doing therapy all the time. And God has guided me to a way of doing therapy that that is really works. And I'm and I'm very glad to have been the, you know, the the shepherd to to his gift to us. Yeah, I, I can testify to you. Uh, your techniques are different. Because, you know, we met because I was one of your patients. And what you've done for me was an absolute miracle. Because we're both, and, and my faith helped me through it too, you know. And of course, I kept pestering you for a month. Yes, <laughs> you did. You were ready. <laughs> yeah, I, I was ready for something. So that's what happened. So we, you became a therapist, and you've been doing it for about 25 years now, isn't it? 30 years? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been off and on doing it since 1976, but I, I quit and I would go do something else and then I'd come back and then I quit because I, because I, I was very dissatisfied with the shape of therapy and I'm very dissatisfied today with the shape of most therapy. I think most therapy sadly is not very good and it's not the therapist's fault. It's that, it's that the effort to make something truly innovative and and truly ambitious hasn't been there so yeah because i know that you're also teaching your methods to other counselors including your own group that you have working for you nice therapy yeah and we're um we actually got um invited to come up to a big conference in vancouver in may um Wonderful. and we're gonna yeah, we're going to we got they we're going to do three presentations which is really like a home run or a triple if you're a baseball person, but mm -hmm. it's um we we it's a very big honor and we'll get a chance to start teaching. It's an international conference too, so it's a real kind of breakout wow. moment for us. We're really happy about that. Isn't that awesome? I didn't know about that. I think that's just absolutely incredibly awesome. I think it's fantastic. Thank Congratulations. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, That's we're we're right. real excited. Yeah, we're real excited. How'd you get the name Nysa Therapy? Well, um, I'm I follow. Um, I work in psychoanalysis a lot. Freud and Jung and Kernberg and. Kohut, those guys. I, that, that's the kind of the foundation of where I work. And those guys, especially in the old days, they like to take names from old uh, Greek mythological stories. So the word narcissism comes from a story about this particular person called Narcissus, right? And he was a very arrogant person. And so they they had a lot of those stories. So we when, when we first started working well, we were working very well with borderline personality and borderline personality are people who have big mood swings and they can't control their emotions and they're very clingy and then they're angry and then they're joyous and ecstatic. They're all over the place. And NYSA is a mountain in, um, in uh, Greece where this one uh, figure called Dionysus was born and raised. And he's like that. He just jumps all over the place. He has these big mood swings and it's not bipolar. It's, it's about, going from ecstasy to grief to sadness to rage all these places and so we named it after after him because of our success with borderline personality okay so you worked a lot with yeah i familiar with borderline personalities my sister was one and it was it was rough yes yeah. of course you did extremely well yeah, with, and me, with my ptsd what's that that you did an extremely yeah. good job with me and my PTSD, good. which we don't need Very to good. details of that, but it, it was it was wicked. It took us a long time. Which, right, and, and the reason, yes, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it took us a long time, but isn't that normal? Take time for this to work properly? Well, yeah, and um, it's your story to tell, not mine. 
but you had a lot of trauma in childhood. And if you've had a lot of childhood trauma, then it takes longer to clean up that much PTSD and mm -hmm. damage. But yeah, it does take a while to get there, but uh, um, not it's it's still fairly short if you can consider the span of a lifetime and getting a chance yeah. to live more well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that. So you're also writing a book, I understand. You have it for a while. I well, know. we've we've moved away from the book and we're just doing it now as a um as an online course, a video course, because oh, okay. we've decided that the modern audience uh, that we're looking for people in their 20s and 30s they they don't read a lot of books but they do look at a lot of videos right and yeah. so yeah so we're we're moving in that direction so it's an online video and we're making a lot of progress we've got we've probably got let's see probably got 14 videos done now for our course Good. but by the time we're done we'll have 140 so we've still got yeah. a long long, a long, to long go, way so. to go that's interesting because it's, it's true because i i made the audio books you know i lay down at night with my book from audible and we listen to my audio books that's right but i won't read one but i'll listen to one for several hours that's at night and that's the same way i feel about my i was a, a blogger at first before i became a podcaster then i discovered people were not reading 35, 45 hour long dissertations. But they'll watch a 45 so, minute hour video, but they won't read that long, which is the reason I became a yeah. podcaster because I get my message out that way. Well, um, it, it's kind of obvious. Reading is very overrated, frankly, because in reading, what you get is a set of abstract symbols that you have to translate in your head to make some sense of them. But you are only using one sense, that's your eyes, and you're only using one process, and that's the translation of these abstract things called letters into meaning, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got if you've got a uh, a podcast, when I say podcast, there's intonation. You listen to the voice. So you're getting the meaning of the words, but you're also getting the feeling underneath it. What's important to me? What am I emphasizing? Where does my voice get quiet and calm? And so, so the move to a more um, uh, verbal and visual kind of way of doing things is involving more of our senses and senses that, that give us much more meaning than just a phrase in a book. Okay, I understand that. I, um, I didn't know the dynamics of it. I just knew that it, that was what was happening. So I switched to become, you know, the podcaster. And yes, because I want to get my message out, which is history, as you know, because you know I'm a big history buff. And uh, oh man, I just lost the question I was going to ask. I'm sorry, Doctor Diggs. That's <laughs> I had a okay. Good question. Okay. I totally lost it. We know how that goes with us old folks. It'll come. We got a lot of yeah, time. It'll it come sure back. will. You know, I can remember the first time we met, which was February 19th, 19, uh, 2019. After bug I called you every every week, I think it was, or every month for every week for a month to get an appointment with you. Finally got yes. tired of listening to me and <laughs> read appointment. <laughs> No, I knew you were going to do the therapy. I I knew you had absolute commitment and and you were committed all the way to getting well. So I couldn't say no to you. Yeah, I I, I still am. I still have a therapist. He's new in the field. He's doing. We're going to right. try some EMDR next week. But this Good. week it's to snow tomorrow, which it's supposed to. So we'll see how that works out with me. I've done EMDR before. You you don't do that, do you? I uh, no, I don't. You don't. So no, you're basically not because I'm against it. No, you're not against you. Know, you're against it. No, I'm not. I oh. think it's a fine thing to do. I've got no problem okay. with it. Oh, okay. I was just wondering because I know that you don't do you do a lot of uh, the stock type. Isn't that it? The empty um, chair. It's 
it's really a combination of a lot of different kinds of therapy, but empty chair work is part of it. That actually comes from a tradition called psychodrama. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Gestalt people took it from psychodrama, but didn't give psychodrama credit. And I think I always believe in giving credit to the roots of where a method comes okay. from. So. I was just wondering how you how that worked out for you because I know it's working for you wonderful because the success yeah, you had because of the hard yeah just imagine you, if you can't yeah you can't I can't do everything is the thing so I've had to select the things I don't do and I decided there are plenty of people who do EMDR and do it well there's no need for me to to do that when other people can do that therapy that's all yeah. that is. So how many people do you have working for you now? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Because I know when you we, you and I first started together, you didn't have that many. You had two or three working for you in the very beginning, way over there. And then you moved on me two or three times. It got me all confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But just I I'm very interested in uh, what motivated you because I know you wrote a book or didn't write a book. You wrote your thesis, right. uh, thesis or whatever they call it for your PhD on a very controversial topic because some people are just very, they don't want to talk about it. It's still taboo to even talk about it, let alone anything else. And and if you don't mind, that was pedophilia. You wrote your, your graduate work on it. Yeah, yes. it was more, it was, pedophilia was part of the, part of the dissertation. Um, it, it was about incest. And when you talk about incest, you pretty much have to talk about ped pedophilia to some degree because yeah. that's the cause of a significant amount of of incest. Yeah. Yeah, because like you showed me the book and it was like five hundred pages and weighed fifty pounds. Yeah, it was huge. It is, and I, I didn't read it obviously. <laughs> so you turn it into an audio book. <laughs> the audio book's coming out, Dale. Exactly. Yeah. In about fifty years. Yeah. So I was just wondering what brought you into the, to do that with as your uh, basis of your thesis, incest. Well, I mean, sadly, I I have um, I have my own incest history. I was uh, I was the victim of incest, and um, and it damaged me a lot. And so, working on writing on it and working on it allowed me to get some kind of perspective and knowledge about what had gone so wrong and why it had gone so wrong. So um, it, it was because of my own history. Well, I was also a victim myself, so I understand what you're talking about. And it's very difficult to talk about even, even today, after all these years of working with you and other over the years, but you've done the most work with me on that over these decades, over the time that I've known you. My question, though, is I know that we've talked about this before, I believe, that you don't, you, most people say you can't not cure a pedophile. And you don't believe that, if I remember correctly. No, you, no. I've, I've successfully treated three people with pedophilia. Now, now that we have to watch our language here a bit because mm -hmm. they're, when you say, is someone a pedophile, then you're saying that their identity, who they are, is part of this disease, right? Mm -hmm. It's part of this disease. Or you can say somebody has pedophilia, and then their identity isn't as, as someone who has pedophilia. It's just a disease they have. So people who we would say that they are pedophiles have tied their identity up in that disease. People we would say who have pedophilia have not tied their identity to that disease. So that would make it easier to, to treat if they don't identify their identify part of their yes. identity. Now, okay, I yeah, got now the, See that? 
Now, the problem with most people who are pedophiles and who say there are pedophiles is they don't want to change. Mm -hmm. they, they don't want to change. But the people I have worked with who have pedophilia don't like it. It's a curse to them. It feels horrible to them. It's like it's like having borderline like you um, like you're saying your sister had. Uh, she didn't like having that disease. She isn't a borderline. She has borderline. Mm -hmm. And um, and if you're if you're someone who has uh, has pedophilia, it's a real curse. You don't want to have that. It happened because of your own developmental trauma when you were growing up as a kid. You got stuck with that disease because of your own trauma. And then when you get stuck with that disease, you know, you're starting to grow up and, you know, you're hitting 16, 17, 18. You're going, oh, my God, I used to like this little girl when I was in the fourth grade, but I still like her sexually. This doesn't feel right. I want to like women who are my age. Mm -hmm. And that, and yet that, that that curse is still there circling around. Well, if people like this come in and they don't want to have that disease, well, yeah, we can take it away. That, it's, it's it's actually not as hard as most people would imagine. Okay, I understand that a lot because you know when you identify as something, you make it a part of yourself and who you are. And if you don't identify with it, it's just something you have. It's like a cold. Exactly. You're not a cold. You have a cold. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, I got it. I understand. And that's makes it very interesting and makes it easier to understand and how because you know you, you're right, there are people who don't want to change. I know bunches of them. You know, I had them in yeah. my own groups when I was a counselor. Yeah. That they just whether they were alcoholic or some other type of mental health illness, they just flat didn't want to change. They fought you tooth and nail. It just wasn't, you know didn't concentrate so much on them as they did on the other ones who wanted to change. So I put my energy. Exactly. You do the same thing. Yeah. Of course, you're, very, you're, you're able to select your patients a lot better than I was able to select my clients. Well, yeah. Yeah. Because I don't imagine you get you're too working many. Drug I wouldn't imagine you got too many who are court no. ordered. Uh, no. No. Um... So the, the court ordered treatments uh, for this, well, first of all, the people who don't want pedophilia actually rarely act out and hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. They don't do it that often um, because they don't want to do it. They don't like it. It's, it's horrible, you know, whereas the people who are pedoph pedophiles, they're going to act out because they really like it and that's what they want to do and no one's going to stop them. Right. All right. And so, um, so in, so the people who have pedophilia, I uh, don't get uh, involved in the legal system as often as, as the people who are pedophiles. Right. Okay. Um, and, but both of those people, if you have someone who has pedophilia and they do act out, they will get involved in court ordered programs. Now, the court ordered programs are um, uh, can be helpful. I, I'm not opposed to them, but they are using methods that are quite antiquated at this point. They're yeah, you I'm, know they're using. As you know well, I'm very familiar with one of them for two other reasons other than being court ordered, but uh, very familiar with one in particular that we both know is. In my personal opinion, she's dangerous, but that's beside the point. We don't want to get there. So, yes, but those those programs are are very dated. They're 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 not using modern psychotherapy techniques at all. They use really antiquated techniques that um, that the legal system likes because they don't have much sophistication. So the legal system says, "Oh, we've got a bad person." We're going to make them drive them to their knees, make them have a hallelujah moment and then come back and say, I'm sorry, I'm going to change and then change. It's it's a very punitive approach that the legal system has. 
And it's just not subtle enough. It doesn't, it lacks so much psychotherapeutic subtlety. We are way beyond that kind of stuff in all the other things that we do. So I work mostly with personality disorder, but you consider you consider having pedophilia a form of personality disorder. And, mm -hmm. and we work with it much more subtly than than that kind of, you know. I've got a great example. I was working drug court a long time ago. And the drug court people used to just say, yeah, they're going to, if they're going to mess up, they're going to pay the price until they are sick of paying the price and then they'll change. Well, no, that's not how most people change is because they're sick of paying the price. You, you can't punishment. Punishment does not work to change behavior. All you have to do is look at our legal system that has an over 60% recidivism rate. That is, yeah. If, if, if you want to lock them bad people up and keep them from hurting society let's be honest about it but if you're pretending that you want people to change punishment isn't the way you do it it no, punish, does punishment and, works. your discipline works not punishment i've i've said that for decades dr davis that if you wanted somebody to change you discipline them and according to well i would I'd even evolve that a little bit further and say, if you want someone to change, you empathize with them and understand their dilemma. Yeah. You know, the, the society is going to extract its pound of flesh, but if you do it through a disciplinary method, rather than a punishment method, because according to what I have read is that uh, uh, discipline is the effect to, uh, to cause a change of behavior through the use of pain. Discipline is to affect behavioral change through learning. Right. That's yeah, what I've been using for years as my benchmark. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. You know, the learning, and then that's where I based my client, my group's on was on learning rather than punishment. Yes, but Dale, you're a very kind and empathetic person. What you had to teach them sunk into them because of your empathy. Oh, okay. I mean, I wish I could get back into therapy, but it's not going to happen. But right. I mean, back into doing it, not being it. I'm already in it. But exactly. Right. So, so those those programs. So anyway, oh, the story about this guy. So we had this woman who she'd been a meth addict since she was 15 she was 28 most of her life she'd been a meth addict and she mm -hmm. got into drug court because she said she wanted to change but she just kept relapsing because she was an addict you know yeah, well, yeah. and we right because and so so we um uh i had a really good judge because the the other judges they just say punisher 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 right and he really wanted to hear what we had to say about how to help her to change. So she relapsed again. And the, the typical drug court thing was two weeks in jail. So I went to her and I said, she'd been in, she started going to CYA, California Youth Authority, uh, by the time she was 16 or something, which is, yeah. you know, juvenile prison. And so I said to her, okay, you've relapsed again. She goes, I know. And I said, would it help you to change to have two weeks in jail? And she said, oh, oh, God, no. Two weeks in jail is just a long nap for me. I go in, I rest, I I kick my drug, I come back out, I'm ready to use again because now it's going to get me higher. I said, okay, so two weeks doesn't do you any good. No, it just makes me ready to use more. I yeah. said, okay. I said, so what would help you to change? And she was shocked that someone was asking her what it would help, what it would do to change. And I said, what would help you to change? And she said, if you made me do my first step, because she knew the 12 steps of recovery, right? The, right. the AANA, 12 steps of recovery, Narcotics Anonymous, make someone do, make me do my first step. And I said, okay, I went and talked to the judge and we set up a plan. And it was so beautiful because it's her turn in court and I was always in court. And so she comes up and the judge was very thoughtful, said, oh, I hear you've relapsed again. And she goes, yeah, I was judge, I'm sorry I have. And he goes, well, OK, here's what we're going to do. 
I've arranged to have your sponsor in the room next door to the court, and she's waiting for you over there right now. I want you to walk into that room, do your first step, and then come back and tell us when you're done. She started weeping, Dale. Oh, she yeah. She started crying. She said, thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. And she went in there. She did that first step, discipline and empathy, both of our right. approaches. Right. She did that. She was disciplined. She wanted to be disciplined. And she came back out, said, thank you. And the last time I saw her, she had a year so plain and sober. That's wonderful. You know, that's just the way I've had clients that way, too, that I, I've just had to say, what's it going to take you for you to get honest with us? Yeah. You know, listening. They want to be listened to. Yeah, they and the punitive heard. approaches, even when you get into the theories of change, if you go into behaviorism, how to make a pigeon do something, how to make a rat do something. You know the least effective way to, to train them? Punishment. I know. I know that. <laughs> it it, it doesn't work. No, it, it doesn't, doesn't work. work it doesn't work for humans. It doesn't work for animals either. Punishment never works, ever. No, you know? it, it does not work. Shame doesn't work uh, very well either, Stephen. No. Shaming somebody is not going to work either. And that's what the judicial system is doing a lot of with certain members of the population that they get involved with is shame. Keep them shamed and and, and, and feeling, you know, I, like I said, I've dealt with people who've been involved with, uh, had to come to my groups as well as the court ordered um, sex offenders groups. And they were t they were talking about being shamed for life. You know, they were they had done something bad, but relatively minor. You know, nothing real nasty. Didn't really hurt anybody. And they're shamed for life because they have to be on the registry. And of course, California now has a tier system. You know, you got ten years, twenty years in life. But if you're on that registry, it's it, it's. The way they were talking, it was just pure guilt and shame. They were being shamed every time they had to go in. It was a sh mm -hmm. or they were jobs, housing, everything was affected by it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that works either. No, shame is shame is punishment. And if you look at at um, the one famous uh, psychoanalyst, Eric Erickson. He developed the psychosocial stages, and the stage that's opposite of shame is autonomy. So if you insist on shaming somebody, you are robbing them of their autonomy. And if you want someone to get well, you have to get make them more autonomous, more yes. working out of their own, their own desires to be well. Now, let me tell you, there are truly bad people out there. There are pedophiles and sociopaths and murderers and Ponzi schemers and all those people. They need to, they're not going to change. This is a deep character in them. They, they don't want to change. They need to be locked up or killed so that society doesn't have to deal with them. I agree. And so you have to make a distinction between the people who that is their character, that's their nature. They're a pedophile. They don't have pedophilia. They're a, um, a criminal. They don't have uh, antisocial personality. I mean, you have to make that distinction. And if you're a truly bad guy, I'm sorry, your life isn't worth much to us. So spend it in prison or we can kill you. It doesn't matter. But yeah. now that's that's not very many people most people who are involved in criminal activity are damaged hurt people who would like to be better yeah i, I noticed that in my own practices i had a lot of people you now the worst the ones that i had the most trouble with in recovery are the self reforms yes they i had more trouble i mean they they made it a lot of them made it but it was a struggle for them 
even though they they wanted it because they came into group on their own or they said they did you know boy they struggled but they worked their little hearts out that is yeah so but but it brings up the point i mean does it help does jail help at all no i've got an answer for you i don't know if you'll think it but I, in my experience, jail has never helped anyone to stop doing something that's bad for them and bad for society. But the fear of jail has stopped many people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And some people only get afraid after you've sent them to jail. So let's send you to jail. So you're afraid and you don't want to go back. Some people are naturally afraid of it. So, but see, that's different. The jail didn't change them. It's their own motivations that said i don't want to do that i don't want to go to jail therefore i will be disciplined and do something else yeah i i have a theory about fear i don't know how accurate it is i've been using it for years though fear is a very powerful motivator right for a very brief period of time once the fear goes away the motivation goes away so you got to stay afraid right to some degree, I would think, according to what you're saying, wouldn't they? Well, I, I think you're exactly right. There's a there's a movement from the fear of consequences to the joy of living a healthier and more well life. Yeah. And you good good therapy will help someone make that movement, make that change. Yeah, OK. Because uh, it. it Yes, I, I keep telling people anybody can stay sober, give it a period for a given a period of time, given sufficient amount of fear. You know, yes. that's the drug court. Yeah. Even though we had here in Denver, we had an excellent judge and an excellent drug court system for about a decade till he retired and then it went to pot, but literally. Uh <laughs> yeah, it was deal. really bad. I mean, most yeah. of his people were, were, were marijuana in that drug court but it was a highly it was very good you know i as a as a member of the uh, as a member of the court i could go before the judge for a particular client say this guy's doing such and such he needs a vacation yeah. or this guy's yeah. doing such and such yeah he screwed up we asked but he doesn't need any time off he needs to be in my group this week yes. not in your jail yeah. and judge Meyer yeah. to say okay Here's my sentence. They either got the time that I said for a vacation or they got the time with my group. An extra six, three months, an extra six months with my group. Some of them were very upset about it, but in the end, they were happy because they got off the off, that, that monkey off their back. But, you know, I've got, I know one that I went into here. I didn't run into, they went to my boss. <laughs> this is funny. And as we got absolutely wanted to come back to group, he says, we want to go to Dale's group. And Dale said, well, I'm sorry, but he retired and moved to California. And he said, he can't retire. He didn't fix me yet. <laughs> That's right. Very good. Very good. As if I could fix anybody, of course. But that's it's, it's, it's well, interesting that, that we agree so much on treatment and, and things, and yet we disagree on so many other things. Yeah, but we're, we're both rational people. We can... Yeah. We can, I can find the truth in your point of view. I can I can let my point of view be um, be modified, not changed at its root, but modified. Yeah. Yeah. I that just finished. I'm going to record it later today. I think uh, on climate change, and it's from your point of view, from the liberal side. It's supporting climate change. I've had to change my mind because I went across some facts that I couldn't dispute. I couldn't couldn't figure out, you know. And the gentleman who did it, his name is Bill McKibben, who was through my church. He's a oh really? Yeah, he's a um, uh, environmentalist and scientist, liberal. Right yeah. I happen the Democratic Party, but what he said made sense to me, so I had to change my mind. I mean, so, right on. So I think you'd like it if you get a chance to. 
Good, and you're you're out at the forefront, but there are more and more um, conservatives who are starting to say there's something to climate change, and yeah. so that's I, and 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 if you can't if you can't change your mind with facts, I I really don't care if you're liberal or conservative. I care if you can think critically about facts. Yeah. <laughs> And I couldn't dispute these facts. I just and I looked yes. him up. I I, I counter checked him, you know, and check fact checked him, and he was right. And I'm going, oh well, I guess. But here's something he didn't talk about that I found out about. You know who the first when the first discussion of climate change was made? No. Twelve hundred BC. <laughs> the Greeks were talking about climate change. What they were saying is, if we tear down this. This force, or we drain this swamp, is it going to bring more or less rain to the area? Yeah. They're talking about climate yeah. change and way back when. <laughs> That's right. This is not a new phenomenon. No. No. But it's interesting that, that, that that's been going on that long. It's and beautiful. Actually, yeah. Yeah. There was a gentleman, I can't pronounce his name, he's a Swedish scientist who uh, actually published the first paper in. 1896 about adding CO2 to the atmosphere and what would happen. Yeah. But you know what I don't hear anything about? And I what? reached it and I can't find it. Is what about all the ships and airplanes and other things that were de destroyed during the wars of the 19th and 20th century sitting at the bottom of the ocean leaking oil? What's that doing? Yeah. I know. I know. Now they talk about the sofa stuff that the, the the cans and the bottles and the uh, things that go around the cans, you know, and all that stuff. They talk about those, those plastic islands, and I agree they need to be cleaned up. But how about this? How, what are they going to do about all that? Yeah, yeah it just makes sense. I bring sense. it up in the podcast. I bring it up and say, hey, what, what's going on here? So, anyway, if you get a chance, you need to listen to that one, I would think. Stephen. Good, good, good. What's in your future? Well, I we we do want to have a positive effect on psychotherapy, on, on the world of psychotherapy. And we are going to do it by understanding some of the facts, thinking critically about the facts. And the first fact is that a bunch of PhDs like me write books about therapy for other PhDs to read. And so PhDs writing books for PhDs. And a PhD rarely thinks about the actual needs of the people who do most of the therapy. And they are master's level therapists who are more feeling type people and not thinking type people. They don't want to hear theory. They want to be shown how to do therapy mm -hmm. and they want to be shown directly how to do it. So about 80% of the therapy in our world is done by master's level people. Most of them are women. Most of them are feeling type people. They're very nurturing people, but they don't want to hear some big story about the theory of, of psychopathology from, you know, psychoanalysis. They want to say, oh, here's how you do it. And my metaphor is that I'm like an architect and you're a contractor and you don't want to read some big architectural manual that I'm using to, to do stress and stress tolerance. You want me to hand you a blueprint so you can build a house. Right. And you, and you are better than me at building that house. Most of the therapists we hire are better than me at therapy. They're more talented. They're more empathetic. They're more engaged. And so we are designing this program to speak directly to those people and teach them very sophisticated ideas, but put those ideas in a blueprint that they can put right to use and start doing therapy. So that's the plan. That's what you're working on. And yeah. knowing you, you're probably pretty darn successful at it with your own staff and the other people through your videos. Do you want to tell people where they can get it's, those videos? 
Uh, yeah, they're not completed yet. We're we're okay. putting them in a course, so they're going to be part of an online course that you'll okay. be able to connect to through through our webpage, nicetherapy.com. But the that course in a very partial form won't be up and running for another about two or three months, but okay. it will be up in that time. Yeah. Yeah. So but they can check it nicetherapy.com to see what yes. it comes up. And if you'll let me know. I'll get it in my yeah. the closest podcast I got to it. Now what? Yeah. That's absolutely, absolutely. So I, think I would it's let great, you know uh, that you know we've been friends for so many years and we still talk. And I think that's marvelous uh, uh, that yes. we still get along so well despite you being a liberal, <laughs> which is nothing. Wrong. I know there's nothing wrong with being a liberal. No, because you're willing no. to look. At you the know, fact. um. I'm a real George Will fan. I don't know how you feel about George Will. But George yeah. Will says that that there is a rhythm to American politics. It's pretty obvious if you think about it, swinging back between conservative to liberal to conservative to liberal. And he says that rhythm is actually a very healthy thing. Yes. Right? I agree with George Will. And so, I'm not a much of I'm not a big fan of his, but I understand what he's saying. I think it's true. I just finished a book, and I know you don't particularly care for him, but Glenn Beck, it's a fiction. Yeah, I I like Glenn okay. I have, I have some real problems with him, but yes, well, I yeah, like him okay. I have a few problems with him myself, but he wrote two fiction books. Right. He wrote several fiction books, and right. two of them, uh, Agenda 21, and Agenda 21, Into the Shadows. They're both fiction. Ah, really? Uh-huh. The basic premise is the United Nations takes over the world. Uh-huh. Based on a, 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 what they call Agenda 21. Right. And it's, the humans are locked up in little conclaves called compounds, and everybody, all the animals are free. All the zoos are emptied out. And protection, <laughs> everything. Earth Protection Agency is manhunters. If they escape the compounds, they send these Earth Protection Agents after you. And it's the story of one family that makes an escape. The first uh-huh. one and the second one is carries on and how they finish their escape. Yeah, I just finished reading them. They're pretty. Done, they're wrong, but they're pretty. I good. didn't read them. I had them read good. to me. I think they're pretty darn good books. Good, good, Glenn. Good for you. So if you get a chance and you feel like it, go ahead and take a week candor at it. Okay. That's a good have, recommendation. You bet. I, I, I've i been recommending that book a lot to a lot of people, because even both of them, because I think they're really good books. And they're fiction, mm-hmm. which I'm not a big fan of fiction. I read, read right. what am I reading now? Conform. It's about Common Core and its education system. It's by Glenn Beck, but it's Common Core. Oh, uh-huh. And the edu- problems with our education system, which yeah. is, to me is making a lot of sense the way he's talking about it. But that's what I'm reading right now, or listening to right now. So, but yeah. anyway, if I... If well... You get, you get any, I know you don't... Yeah, I mean, as, as a liberal... Yeah, go ahead. As a liberal, I can tell you, I think that the education system is really bad. So I don't see any problem disagreeing with conservatives on that. It's it's really bad right now. It is really bad. And yes. I, I, I wish I didn't have, you know, I wish, I'm glad. I wish I had my grandchildren through school. Got a couple of them through now, but even that, they, it's too late. They've been brought up in this with that type of common education of common core, mm-hmm. which the people in Poughkeepsie, Illinois, do not learn like the people in Chico, California. It's two different cultures. Yes. You can't yes. have it the same, in my opinion. Yes. And I think you agree with that statement. Yes. Yeah, I do. I do. So, but anyway, if you get a chance, I, I'd highly recommend Agent. Agenda 21 and Agenda 21 into into the shadows. Okay. Because they're really good books. Okay. 
with you know nice books. And uh, anyway, I'm going to shut off the recording now, and we'll continue our discussion. Okay. Of course, we'll put you in on a couple of things more that we need to get done because we've got about ten minutes left here before I have to shut it off. But just hang tight Thank for one you second. For listening to the show. There are show notes and a place to comment at https colon forward slash forward slash coffee dash time dash again dot lipson dot com forward slash website. He hopes that you liked what you heard and will tell others about him. Dale is attempting to get a following that both disagrees and agrees with him. He does not want yes men. If you disagree, wonderful. He is happy to have you here as a part of the Coffee Time Again team. Dale does not talk about the news of the day. He is attempting to give a history lesson that is just as important about what is going on in the headlines of today. Please do not hesitate to contact him. Just remember that Dale wants a clean show, meaning no cussing, name calling, yelling, or hate aloud. You can disagree with him and not be disagreeable about it. Support him and keep help keep this alive https colon forward slash forward slash glow dot fm forward slash coffee dash time dash again <laughs>